Hello, welcome to this episode of the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Today we've traveled a little bit. We're over in Charlotte, Michigan. We're with Dan Wamba, owner of Wamba White & Company. They produce Civil War garments. Are we here to talk about garments today? Well, not really. We'll talk about those later in future episodes. In today's episode, let's start talking about how to evaluate a reproduction. You want something because you want to be in Civil War reenacting or in one of the fraternal orders. You want it on your shelf or you're just looking at it and trying to decide what's good quality compared to an original. Well, this has been a conversation that's been going on for decades now in our hobby, and Dan, being one of the manufacturers, has sure thought about it a lot. Dan, why don't you talk with me a little bit about the three major tenets of evaluating a reproduction? Sure, yeah. For many years, um, there's been three basic criteria upon which we, we judge you know reproduction garment and um, those have always been uh, pattern construction and materials. To get a little bit more in depth on those, uh, first off by pattern we mean um, was the reproduction patterned off an original? Did they use an original garment in this case to, uh, to draw that reproduction and, and not only that but scale it up for sizes that we, that we require using original pattern techniques and uh, that way the fabric you know falls off the body in a correct way and it, it gives you the proper appearance and it can it can be a very subtle thing but you know we in in the case of of our jacket here we make sure that the front the curve the front curvature is the right angle and all that so that when it's put on it wears properly and i mean very very minor details like that can really mean the difference between something that looks like a pajama top and something that is an authentic garment. Construction, of course, uh, at the time of the Civil War, and talking about our garments again, the um, sewing machine was very had, had just come on as a kind of a new technology, and it had been largely perfected. Um, it was widely adopted and used by a number of you know firms and private contractors and even some government uh, institutions to produce the clothing. Um, it's not as common with Confederates simply because uh, as the machines broke down it became more difficult to replace the parts um, and, and maintain them. Uh, so most of their items are constructed simply with a needle and thread so it's hand sewn. But even on these federal garments where 90% uh, of the manufacturing is done with a sewing machine very similar to the modern machines we have today you'll see features like the buttonholes will be hand sewn always. Uh, you know a buttonhole machine had been patented prior to the Civil War but it hadn't been perfected for use so you didn't see its use in Civil War produced garments. Uh, so they should all have hand sewn buttonholes whether it's north or south. Um, finally with materials are the materials of a fiber content that's, that's, that's in keeping with what was available at the time of the Civil War. Uh, cottons and wools were by far the most common um, so it, you know, is, is that the kind of fiber content that you're seeing in your reproduction? Uh, we, we've had occurrences where you know we thought a product was 100% wool. Um, I made a pair of pants for a friend of mine. He got too close to the fire and it melted off of him because there was a high synthetic content in it, and it melted under heat. Whereas the wool just it wouldn't have bothered it at all. Um, so it's it's very important to understand the fiber content, um, that it's woven properly to give you the outward appearance, the same as the original garment. And especially in union items, the color is incredibly important. Uh, they dyed with indigo then. And as a natural dye, indigo produced a very pure blue color that uh, did not have any red in it. And why that's important is because it was blue, not purple. And so especially in union items, um, if there's red in the dye, or too much red in the dye, you'll, ha you'll get a purple appearance rather than a pure blue. Nothing you get today will be really dyed with indigo. I mean, there's not much of an industry here in the U.S., especially in India. Of course, they do denim for blue jeans and things like that with indigo, and you notice your denim blue jeans are a beautiful pure blue more often than not. Um, but again, that's, that's a, there's no more indigo dye in the country, so it's important to use modern dyes that kind of have fidelity to that to the original indigo appearance great well let's leave your experience as a uniform maker and go to your experience as a living history you've talked about the big three you've talked about pattern construction mm -hmm. materials you have a fourth yes yeah tell me about that yes and this is a concept i've kind of been toying with for many years and and trying my best to put into words but the best um summation i can make of it is is context 
That's the, to me, that's the fourth criteria upon which we should evaluate a reproduction. And what's meant by that is that is that reproduction item appropriate for the portrayal, especially the living history portrayal you're trying to put on. Um, a, a coat can be patterned exactly off of an original, uh, absolutely perfectly constructed out of just the best materials available, but if you are wearing it, um, say, at a first bull run event, and it's something that didn't come by until 1864, then you are, your portrayal is out of context. To me, the, the, the cornerstone of context is understanding what was commonly worn by the soldiers at the time, and especially if you're portraying, say, a specific regiment, um, you know, whether it be a northern regiment or a southern regiment, where did they get their first uniforms when they enlisted? Where were they issued uniforms as the war went on? And um, what, what did they look like at a certain time? Uh, use original accounts to, to figure these things out. And, um, you know, basically that will give you an idea towards, you know, what, what you should be portraying at a certain time. And granted, this is not uh, uh, um, an argument for everybody to be cookie cutter and everybody to be identical. Soldiers, to a certain extent, personalized their uniforms. Um, it, I like the case of Confederates who, you know, even as the war went on, they were drawing all their clothing from central, the central government, uh, yet you still see them put state buttons on their coat. So, it, and that's kind of a subtle way. They're well within the context of their portrayal, but they, they've done a slight variation that makes it individualized to themselves. Well, there you go. Pattern, materials, construction are the main three once you've picked up that reproduction, make sure you stay within context. That's the Civil War Digital Digest episode for today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Dan Shop, we'll put a link below to our vendors page with our partner, All Michigan Civil War. It'll give you a link to Wamba White & Company. Additionally, if you've enjoyed this episode, we'd appreciate it if you'd like the episode and subscribe to the Civil War Digital Digest. Have a great day.